All right. All right, uh, we're Leviticus chapter 16, and it starts off where it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. And it's kind of interesting that they that that this section starts off that way. It starts off with re, with going back to uh, uh, Nadab and Abihu and how that they offered a strange fire unto the Lord. And then it goes into the two goats that are on, in the Day of Atonement. On the on the Yom Kippur. So the interesting thing here is that there is a tie back to Nadab and Abihu because we know that Nadab and Abihu had offered strange fire. They actually went into the Holy of Holies and offered that strange fire upon the altar. So when Nadab and, uh, and, and Abihu did that, they they broke to several several different things. One, they weren't the high priest, so they shouldn't have went in. Second of all, they didn't go in at the right time so god god is setting it down and, and he he's he's uh, establishing this upon the memory of a nadab and abihu so he's saying he basically he's saying uh, uh, because because i want you to remember nadab and abihu so that you don't do what they did so that so that you understand that my presence is going to be there in that tabernacle and and you're, you're going to have to come in a prescribed way to be in my presence. And then only one person can do that, a specific person, under specific, uh, under specific uh, cleansings and things like that. So, so he's setting us up for the Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement. And the, 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 the first thing he talks about is the two goats, the two goats. Now, in, in your King James Bible and most many of your English translations, uh, it translates that as scapegoat. And that is a horrible, horrible translation of that word. The word is actually Azazel, and Azazel means, uh, it, 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 it's, it means de de um, departure or... or uh, uh, a um, a sending out away. Um, it has to do with removal. So, if you want to, if you if you're in your, this is the only the only chapter in the entire Bible, the only place in the Bible that Azazel even even appears. It only, it only appears here in Leviticus chapter sixteen. So, when you see the word scapegoat, just put in there removal, because what 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 happened is that. The, the priest would take two identical goats. And because they couldn't choose between the two of them because they were identical, they would cast lots. One of them would be for Yahweh. And so they would put, they would, they would take a paper and they would have it on, written on the paper, let Yahweh, two or four Yahweh. And uh, so that lit in the pre prefix is the word two or four. So that would be four Yahweh or two Yahweh. And then they would have, on the other, uh, the other sheet of paper, they would put lit Azazel for removal. So one is for Yahweh, one is for removal. And so then he would take and he would cast the lots. And the lot that fell for Yahweh, he would lay that that his hand with that sign upon that goat. The one that was for Azazel, he would take that and he would lay that on, lay that hand on the other goat. And he would mark the two goats, one for Yahweh, one for Azazel. Then he would do some other offerings, he would do some other things. And then he would come back to the goat for removal, the goat for, the goat for Azazel. And he would lay his hands upon the goat. Now this is interesting because when he lay, when he laid his hands upon the goat, he actually leaned upon the goat. Uh, it would be, in other words, he put his weight upon there. So he's actually putting the weight of the sin upon the goat. And then he, he confesses all the sins of Israel and puts them on that goat. Then the goat then is taken out into the wilderness. Now, they, uh, when, when they set this up in Jerusalem, they actually had 10 different stations. They actually have a mountain called Mount Azazel now, which, was, which is the mountain that they would take, and they would, uh, they would take the goat and push him off the cliff. So there was actually a mountain that's called Mount Azazel. 
And so they, they would take, take that goat out to, out to that place uh, in Jerusalem. They would. Now in the wilderness, they, they, they just took him out into the wilderness. And they, they, would, literally, they would literally push the goat. They, before they push the goat, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to a second. They would have, they have 10 different stations. And so at each station, they would, they would post somebody there. And so you have 10 different stations with different posts. And then when the when they, uh, priest that got to the, uh, to the mountain there, to, you know, to the cliff, then they would tie a scarlet red, uh, I'm sorry, when, when, the, uh, when the high priest would uh, identify the Azazel in the beginning, before they would drive him out, he would tie a scarlet thread. So this goat has got a scarlet thread on him. And when he gets out to the mountain, the priest that's out there just before he takes, the, takes that goat and throws him over the cliff, he takes that scarlet thread and he tears the thread in two leaving one half of that thread upon the goat and the other half of the thread he, he has, he, he keeps. And so then what happens now is that they, the, uh, the, they put, they put, they push the goat over and the scarlet thread that the, that the priest keeps l literally changes to white. And this is in the Mishnah. This is a, uh, this is recorded that all these years, that 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 scarlet thread would would change colors, and so when the scarlet thread uh, threads change colors, the the they would they would relay the message back through the ten stations all the way back to the high priest. The high priest would would uh, declare that their sins have been forgiven for another year. Then he would go and he would offer the other goat upon the altar and and the thing and everything like that. Now. They probably they probably didn't uh, push push the goat off any cliff when they were in the wilderness. Uh, I'm sure they just let the, let the goat loose. Um, but Jewish people, being like they are with with guarding the Torah and putting a fence around the Torah, they wanted to make sure that the that the goat didn't uh, didn't come back that he actually was. So it, they probably ended up uh, adding a little bit of a of a uh, of a ceremony there that uh, about about having him um, having him pushed over the cliff. Now it's interesting that uh, that 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, this scarlet thread did did not turn white anymore. Um, and the, I believe the reason was because the uh, the goat, uh, the one what's been represented here, it was already was already uh, crucified. Now, so these two goats, the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> you have to understand the, the Israelites, they're not spiritual beings like you and I. So they only understand things on a natural level. So God had to come up with a natural way of, of showing them something about something that's going to be in the future. And so he gives them these two goats to show, him, show them something about the future that there would be something that would come along that one part of that because they the, the interesting thing is is when they when they take the when they take the goat it says that uh says um uh, over here in verse five it says and he shall take of the congregation of the children of israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering so both goats were the sin offering it wasn't just the one that was sacrificed that was for the sin offering, and it wasn't just the one that, that took the sins away was for the sin offering. Both goats were the sin offering. So it took both goats to, to bring the sin offering on the Day of Atonement. Both goats did. Now we know that Yeshua was 100% God and 100% man. And so this, this, is, this is where Yeshua ties in with the two goats. Because as man, he could die on the cross. As God, he could remove sin. So it took both. It took someone who was both man, who could die, and God, who could remove sin. And so these two goats represent Yeshua on the cross. And here's the interesting thing. Isaiah 53 says that we are all like sheep. Have gone gone astray. We we have. Um, let's say over to Isaiah fifty three real quick. We'll just go over there. <clears throat> it says verse six. 
Verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The sins, our sins were laid upon him. And he took them away. He laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Every He leaned on Yeshua and put the weight of our sin upon him. And then he took those sins into an outer place where there is no more remembrance. He took it and buried it in the deepest sea. When I was in the Navy, we passed over uh, this one uh, place, uh, uh, the Mara, Mara Nostra, uh Trench, I think, or something like that. And we passed over that. And I, I worked on the pathometer. I worked on the uh, machine that actually uh, determined how deep the water was underneath the ship at, at all times. And I kept that pathometer going. I was an electronics technician. And so that particular time, I, I was curious about when we passed over that, what would happen. And so the pedometer is reading and it's reading and the and and it's showing deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then all of a sudden, we don't see it doesn't do anything because the way the pedometer reads uh, works is that it sends out a signal. It sends out a ping, and that ping goes out. And when it bounces off something that's that's solid, it comes back. Well, this trench was so deep that it, the ping would go down but it didn't have the strength enough to come back up. And so we would lose, we, we, we wouldn't be able to, so it was literally fathomless. They tell me that you can turn the, the Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, you can turn that one upside down and drop it in that trench and you would have several hundred miles, uh, or, or uh, 7, 000, several thousand miles, not hundreds, but several thousand miles of water above the mountain uh, after you drop the peak of that into into that trench. That's how deep that water is, and that's where your sins are. Buried in the deepest sea, yes, that's good enough for me. I'll tell you what, that, that's just that's just an awesome thing uh, about about that. So he he was he was hundred percent God, he took away our sin, he was hundred percent man, he died, he died on the cross. So it took it took both of those. And that, that's, that's, uh, so that's, that's showed in these two goats. Um, there was something else, but I can't remember what it is. Maybe I'll just come back to it. <clears throat> but I want to go on and, and talk a little bit uh, also about this, fact, uh, this uh, subject about being holy even as I am holy. Being holy even as, holy, as I am holy. So I want to ask you a question. What is, what, what does it mean? What, what does the word holy mean? Anybody? What does the word holy mean? Set apart. Set apart. Yes. Anybody got any other definition besides set apart? Okay. Set apart. Separated. It is something that it is something that is set apart for a special use. See, you've been bought with a price. You've been set apart for a special use. You are, you are a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him that has brought you out of darkness into his glorious light. Holiness is being set apart. Now, there's two, there's two facets to holiness. There's the holiness that God does because he sets you apart. When you, are, when, when you are born again, God set you apart for a purpose. I remember my mother when I was, when I was growing up as a, as a young boy, she would, she would take me on her lap and she would say, David, she said, one of these days, you're going to give your heart to the Lord. And when you do, God has a special plan just for you. Because she knew something. She knew that when you're born again, you're set apart. That's why it's important for us to understand that God sets us apart. You're not, God has made you different from the world. 
Now, if you keep on playing around with the world, you're, it's, it's, going to, it's not going to be it's not going to be pleasant for you. You're, you're going to feel uncomfortable because you don't belong there. You don't belong in the world. And so what happens is that we start, we start having these issues because we don't, we don't understand that, we, that we're, God has set us apart. But then we have the other part of holiness, and that's where I set myself apart. Now, I cannot make myself holy. Nobody can make, I can't make myself set apart. God sets me apart. Then I, I then, then I do those things that God has set me apart unto. So he's, he's set me apart unto holiness. He's brought me, he set me apart to be set apart. He set me, he's, he's, he has set me apart is so that I could be set apart. In, in, the, in the New Testament, we're called saints. I don't know if you know that or not. And the word saints is, is taken from a word, the Greek word, hagiazo. And hagiazo means holy one. So a saint is a holy one. So you are holy. God, God calls you holy. Now, then you have a responsibility to be holy. So first of all, he calls us holy. Then we have a responsibility to be set apart. We have a responsibility to be holy and to stay set apart, to stay holy, to continue in that which he has placed us in. So we get placed in there positionally, but then we experience that set apartness in our, in our lives. Come out from among them, saith the Lord, and be ye separate. Come out from among them. You, you, you are called unto holiness. You're called unto being set apart. You're called unto sainthood. You are a saint. Somebody said, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you I were will. a sinner. I will grant you that. And you are saved by grace. But you're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint. Now, you may not, you may not be operating in all the, all the set-apartness that you should be operating in. But that doesn't mean that in positionally you aren't set apart. Because God has set you apart for a special purpose. If you don't fulfill that purpose, then you are then you are then in a in a terrible state because you you you've got you've got the um what is it uh, what what am I trying to say you you've got you got the uh, you got the uh, reputation you might as, you might as well enjoy the benefits right you might as well you might as well jump in with both feet if you once God sets you apart you might as well jump in both feet and just be set apart. And, and stay as set apart as you can from the world to, to do everything within your power to stay apart. Here's what a lot of people uh, mistakenly think. Okay, well, God, God, God has made me holy, so therefore nothing I do makes any difference. Well, only. Hmm. He said, be ye holy, even as I am holy. Uh, the interesting thing is in the Hebrew, there uh, the the two words the, the two words that are used uh, both, uh, in both places is the word kadosh. He said, "Be ye kadosh, even as I am kadosh." The first time where it says, "Be ye kadosh," in other words, you be kadosh, you be holy. First one is spelled without the vowel. It is spelled um, it is spelled um, uh, kuf dalit. Kadosh. The second time when it's talking about God, it's spelled with the Baal. The Kuf, the Dalit, the Baal, and the Sheen. When a word is spelled, when a word that has the uh, you know, vowel there with the, uh, the Baal has the vowel in the, in the middle, and then, uh, then it's, and it's written two different ways, one without the Baal and one with the Baal. When it's written with the Baal, it's called a com the complete form or the perfect form. When it's when it's without the ball, it is an incomplete form or or an imperfect form. So our holiness is always going to be imperfect compared to God's holiness because God's holiness is a perfect holiness. So we are never going to have the per the the kind of perfectness that God has on this side of glory. Now, when we get when we get to heaven, we'll be able to live in that kind of glory. 
But that does not excuse me to, to, to live like I should, like I, I want to. That does not excuse me to do that. Because God's demand on me is to be holy, to take the holiness position that he's given to me and do something with it and to stay in that holy state and to continue in that holy state. That also has to do with, with following, following his, his commandments and his laws. One of the things that really, I guess, um, kind of um, got me... Um, Kind of goes a turning point with me when it comes with the Torah and uh, and and studying the Torah, the five books of Moses, and the rest of the uh, rest of the Tanakh or the Old Testament, whatever you want to call it, is uh, when I realized that in Revelation that, uh, that there were those that had kept His commandments, that had kept His Torah. Now I'm sitting there thinking, you know, at the end of time. We're going to be judged according to the Torah. We're going to be judged according to whether we kept his commandments or not. And I think intent has a lot to do with that. We need to be Torah pursuant. To do as much as we possibly can to live like, like God lives and like God wants us to live. And to do with everything within our power to live that way. When we find that we are coming short to, to change our thinking of, to match what the Word of God is saying. And I understand when you're reading, especially when you're reading Leviticus, uh, sometimes you think, well, you know, they stone people for, they, they stone people for doing things that are wrong. I, I don't know whether they want to stone people today. There's a principle behind everything that we have to look at. And it's the principle that is important. So what is the so you're gonna to have to look, you're gonna to have to read the white behind the black in the letters. You're gonna to have to look at the principle behind it. And then then apply those principles to your life. And when we do that, then we'll we'll, we'll start we'll start uh, we'll start being much much closer to the Lord than we ever have been before. Now there's some things that 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 are, are that are unchangeable. Uh, the Sabbath is unchangeable. The that's an unchangeable, um, unchangeable thing. The feast days are unchangeable. Uh, we're going to be celebrating the feast in the New Jerusalem. We find out we're in the Book of Zechariah, and he uh, he says that we're going we're going to um, we're going to uh, come come there on the feast of uh, of uh, Sukkot, the feast of Tabernacles, and we're going to uh, we're going to be uh, coming to Jerusalem and celebrating the feast. So we're going to celebrate the feast. Why not? Why not celebrate them now? And I mean, celebrate them not in the traditional uh, way that the that Catholicism has handed down to us over the years, but in the way that the early believers celebrated the feast. They celebrated Passover, Pesach. They celebrated Pentecost, which is Shavuot. They celebrated the uh, they celebrated uh, uh, Sukkot. They celebrated uh, the day of uh, Yom Kippur, you celebrated uh, Yom Terah. I got a little, little bit out of order there, but that's okay. And so they celebrated these feasts, in the, in, in the early believers did. And it was, it, uh, it was Easter came along, Easter came along through, through Catholicism, and so did Christmas, came through Catholicism. So if, if, if we're celebrating the feast that that have brought, been brought to us through a a, a pagan uh, influenced uh, organization of the called the Catholic Church, and, and we're we're neglecting the feast that God set up, the feast that we're going to be celebrating at the end. I want to tell you something. That there's not there's nothing that says that that in the, in the new Jer in the new Jerusalem that we're going to celebrate celebrate uh, Christmas or Easter. It's not going to be there. But I can guarantee you we'll be celebrating Passover. We'll be celebrating Shavuot. We'll be celebrating the uh, the feast of Sukkot. So that that there was other things, but that was probably the thing that just tipped it over for me is when I realized that in the, in the future kingdom we're going to be we're going to be celebrating the feast and we're going to be living uh, uh, we're living very closely to what the Torah has now. 
Granted, I don't believe that we're necessarily going to have the we're going to have the sacrifices because Yeshua is the fulfillment of all those sacrifices. We're not going to have the Levitical priesthood because there was a, a there was a change in the priesthood. It, uh, when Yeshua came, he changed the priesthood, and because of the, uh, and he became a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And if if that change of the priesthood necessitated the change in the law, so 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 the where we have a we have a higher we have a different priesthood we have a high priest now that is that is not touched by infirmity we, in fact we read that in our readings over there in hebrews um we we can just go over there in hebrews so uh, we have such a high priest verse 11 and uh, chapter 9 Said, but Christ being come and a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. And so this, this so now we now we've tied back to the two goats again. We tied back to that. That that we have a, a high we have a different high priest now and he, he is a priest that, that ministers to the true tabernacle, the one that's not made with hands. Uh, so uh, the the whole uh, concept here of of um, Yom Kippur and and uh, and the and the salvation message that, that came about that because he took away our sins he died upon the cross and he was he rose from the dead and he was and he was risen and he went into glory and so uh, so we have we have that 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 uh, that that uh, thing there so. <clears throat> The book of Leviticus is a book that teaches us about holiness. It teaches us how to live a holy life. It teaches what we should avoid and what, what we should, what we should uh, uh, embrace. There are some things that do avoid, but there are other things that we should embrace. And so this, these are, these are, this is our instruction manual to get the bride ready for Christ. The entire Bible is about a wedding. And so Leviticus is a book to prepare the bride, to prepare the bride for Yeshua. He is he's going to prepare a place for us. Our job is to prepare ourselves for him. He's preparing a place. We're preparing ourselves. We're getting ourselves ready. He's, guys, he's coming for a bride that is without spot or wrinkle, or any such or any such thing he is coming for a spotless bride that has no blemish he's coming for somebody and i want to tell you something he's coming for a bride not a girlfriend sometimes people they all they want to do is just show up on uh one, once a week but he's he's wanting a bride he's wanting somebody that will be with him 24 hours a day seven days a week every day he wants somebody that that he can have a relationship with, that he can talk to, that he can that he can converse with, that he can that he can hold and he, he can touch. He wants he wants to have that relationship with you. And so he wants a bride. He's looking for a bride, but not just any bride, a particular bride, a set apart bride, a bride that loves his commandments. A bride that loves his Torah. A bride that loves him with all their heart. But we're going to dismiss unless somebody's got something. And I'll uh, I'm going to do the priestly blessing over us because I think we we need we need to have we need to have his uh, his blessing on us. Yisai Yahweh Panav, Eleka, be a same Shalom. The Lord will bless you and he will keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you and he'll be gracious to you. The Lord will lift his countenance upon you 
He will give you peace. Amen. Amen. Take care, everybody. We'll see everybody on Shabbat. See y'all. Bye. 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 See you Saturday. Bye, Bye. Renee.